The island of New Guinea's got a complicated political history. One of the more arbitrary colonial boundaries effectively splits it in two right down the middle. And that's a boundary between what was then Netherlands or Dutch New Guinea to the west and British and German New Guineas uh, to the east. Now British and German New Guinea ultimately became the independent state of Papua New Guinea while Netherlands New Guinea uh, in 1962 uh, was taken over by the Republic of Indonesia which inherited the rest of the state of the Netherlands East Indies. So it's a uh, an island that has ethnographic and environmental continuities that extend from one end of the island to the next, but that's been divided historically into a whole series of quite different colonial administrations. And the experiences of people across the island have therefore been really radically different. There are very few roads in, in Papua, and even where there are roads, often they're not sealed, which means during the rainy season, what should take an hour can take six hours and many people have to walk for several days to get to a regional centre. You can get around by light plane but it's expensive and often the flights are delayed for several days because of poor weather conditions so it's, it's an incredibly remote part of the province, the highlands. After the rest of Indonesia uh, received independence in 1949 the Dutch decided to keep uh, Netherlands New Guinea for themselves. They were not interested in handing it over to Indonesia and this was a, a bone of contention for many years. The Indonesians agitated uh, at the UN for the return as they saw it of the last remaining piece of the, the Netherlands East Indies to the Republic of Indonesia. Um, the Dutch had done very little by way of development uh, in in Netherlands New Guinea and they launched into a sort of a frantic phase of uh, catch-up development during the 1950s but it wasn't sufficient and didn't meet the requirements of the United Nations and critically I think it failed to attract the support of the United States and as the US swung in behind the Republic of Indonesia it became obvious to the Dutch that they couldn't keep the territory any longer and uh, in 1962 they formally left and handed over to an interim United Nations administration which then handed administration over to Indonesia in 1963. Now, unfortunately, by then, you'd, you'd had a, a small elite of Papuans trained by the Dutch, uh, and they imagined themselves becoming leaders of a new and independent uh, state of, uh, of West New Guinea, or West Papua. And so almost immediately, the terms were set for conflict between Jakarta and, and a Papuan elite and a vast mass of Papuans who'd had very little by way of education or government services up till then. The Indonesian government tends to be quite defensive when confronted with criticism about the human rights situation in Papua. And that's partly because there's so much distorted reporting that comes out through pro-independence solidarity groups. But they haven't addressed these concerns adequately and a lot of allegations of human rights abuses are never thoroughly investigated by the government. But the way that Papua tends to be viewed by most officials in Jakarta is either as a security problem that needs to be managed or a problem of poverty and economic development. But justice and human rights issues are not something that the government is comfortable actively engaging on for the most part. The official Indonesian government position seems to be that they want to restrict access to Papua for security reasons, that there is this long-running, uh, quite low-level insurgency from an armed resistance movement, the OPM in Papua, and that there are um, occasional skirmishes between OPM and the security forces, which is true. They say that they want to restrict access in case foreigners become caught up in security incidents as we had seen once in Aceh but also the killings of the two American school teachers and one Papuan school teacher in Timbarapura a few years ago is also cited heavily as an example from the Indonesian government as a reason to restrict foreign access. They are allowing access on a case-by-case -case basis if you apply for access from Jakarta. So members of embassies in Jakarta have been allowed to go, and some members of foreign press have been allowed to go. But 
not everyone who's made a request has been granted permission, and the, and some of those who've been granted permission have had that permission severely restricted. For example, when the EU Troika delegation went to Papua, they were escorted everywhere they went. When they arrived in Wamena, their trip was completely cut short. They weren't allowed to go to the places they wanted to go to. They were just taken to school and then basically um, put back on the plane. So it was a pretty useless trip for them. After Papua's incorporation uh, within Indonesia in 1963, uh, there were almost immediate revolts starting in 1965 and 1966, uh, particularly in the Bird's Head area in the northwest. Um, small groups of people protesting what they saw as injustice or uh, the lack of freedom to actually articulate their desire for independence. Uh, and these small rebellions were met with fairly harsh repression by the Indonesian army, which in many respects regarded the entire province as, as something that it had by right of conquest. It was the dominant government agency, if you like, in the province. Um, these rebellions simmered in, in many areas and then really flared up in 1977, 1978 in a province-wide rebellion uh, with some degree of coordination uh, amongst commanders of the gathering resistance movement called the Organisasi Papua Merdeka, or OPM, the Free Papua Movement. So there were simultaneous or near simultaneous uprisings throughout the province in 1977, and the army responded uh, extremely harshly, uh, and there was basically a running battle for about 12 to 18 months. Uh, tens of thousands of people at that point fled into the forests, and some of those communities have remained in the forest uh, and away from uh, established settlements since 1977-78. <laughs> There's been a constant cycle of uh, resistance and repression in the highlands pretty much since 1977, so for about 30 years. And you have a, a population that is essentially entirely alienated from the Indonesian state uh, living in the highlands uh, and quite accustomed now to this regular cycle of flight into the forest, return under certain conditions and usually more repressive conditions to uh, the rural centres and settlements. Uh, under increasing numbers of troops. No, me on the new we married them all. Tahun, ah, dua ribu empat, ah, seribu sembilan ratus, dua ribu empat ni ribu nak, ribu kau ni nak, kau ni nak, ah, jigin pamban, abis jigin pamban, ada jigin pamban kau ni nak, kau ni nak, ni orang dah perlahan ni orang dah polusi kau ni nak, sampai orang dah, orang orang dah ini pun kau, tahun, orang dah dua ribu tujuh ribu. There's extreme anxiety that pro-independence activists will give information to foreign journalists that will damage the reputation of Indonesia. And of course, that's going to happen. But I believe that if access were opened up, although there would initially be some very critical stories, it would actually help to bring balance to reporting on Papua. After 8th of December, when um, uh, two military men, one from Popasos that we call uh, Indonesians, uh, special forces killed by unknown people because until now we don't have any formal report and then to find out who is the perpetrator of the killing military personnel over there. But you know that without any um, 
without any evidence, yeah, without enough evidence, military has suddenly sent uh, troops, yeah, also police, uh, police commander here sent mobile squad members to Mulia and then they start searching for the perpetrators and then it has created more impact for the IDPs yeah, because people got um, fear and then they decided to move move from Mulia to to safe place in Yamo district. Yeah. I would imagine that in the 1970s tens of thousands of people were in the forest for, for periods of, of several months or more. Um, it's very hard indeed to get uh, precise figures either for the numbers of people killed uh, or for the numbers of people displaced. Uh, what it is rather than a a humanitarian situation in which you've got a fixed internally displaced population that requires constant assistance. You've got a condition in which people are continually subjected to the threat of displacement. Um, to some degree they control their movement and they're confident within their own territories, but they're hunted uh, within their territories by the military uh, who have access to helicopters. Um, and so it's, a, it's an extremely unstable uh, condition and uh, the fact that it's been persisting for 30 years now means that an entire generation has grown up knowing nothing but this constant cycle of dislocation. I have to make clear that we always have a similar situation when some of uh, military men kill by unknown people and then um, without any evidence that the uh, military and the police they just uh, blame uh, blame the civilians 
uh, civilians involved in this kind of incidents yeah, or, or OPM or uh, guerrillas group. Yeah. And that's why we, we always, if we have this kind of situation, we always ask for the authority to make a clear investigation and then to find out the perpetrators yeah, and then bring them to the court, bring them by the, to the legal process. I think the level of fear and anxiety and suspicion is pretty much constant. Uh, things are animated by particular incidents, such as this recent killing of, uh, of two Indonesian army soldiers, which has led to the most recent cycle of displacement. But uh, in fact, that's just because we happen to have heard about it. Um, and certainly since the 1970s, there have been any number of incidents that haven't received any form of international attention. Now, access for the media to uh, West Papua is, is one of the key problems. The military and the security forces and uh, intelligence in Indonesia maintain very strict control indeed over access to Papua and uh, journalists are certainly not generally welcome and certainly not in remote areas uh, such as the Highlands. From the research that Human Rights Watch has done in the Central Highlands regions we've definitely found a pattern of chronic and endemic human rights abuse by police officers, more specifically mostly by green mob officers on sweeping operations looking for suspected members of OPM, but also just a daily abuse by police officers who come into contact with the civilian population and because they are working in areas that are incredibly remote and isolated, there are no checks and balances, no oversight on what they're doing, so the abuse is occurring with complete impunity. In terms of Human Rights Watch, we have made several written and verbal requests to Indonesian government officials in various different branches in the Indonesian government, including to the President himself, members of Foreign Affairs, and we have consistently either had the permission denied or had no response. <laughs> Kinabiagualega. <laughs> We wrote this report and then gave to the government that the, um, the result that we want to see uh, from the governments that they firstly, because it was part of humanitarian uh, situation, that we asked government to distribute logistic to the community in, uh, uh, in Yamu district, yeah, to the IDPs. And then um, the uh, second point that we mentioned to government, to local government, to ask for military to withdraw their uh, troops in Mulia. There are periodic clashes between OPM guerrillas and Indonesian armed forces, and they're usually followed up by sweeping operations in areas where OPM fighters are suspected to be sheltering. But there are not constant large-scale military operations in Papua and there's no evidence that thousands of new troops are pouring into the province as some claim. We published this report uh, together with the, with the church leaders in Jayapura uh, and then the statement came by a military commander here, uh, Trikora uh, military commander here. He mentioned that no military operation in Punjab Jaya and then no IDPs in Punjab Jaya. 
that was a reaction uh, came from uh, military officials here, not only in Jayapura but also in Jakarta. But uh, lately, one of uh, officials in Jakarta uh, stated that uh, it is through uh, the impact uh, that's IDPs, IDPs in Puncak Jaya is the impact of military operation over there. It is not publicly they uh, made a statement in the, in the close meeting with several diplomats in Jakarta that they, um, they mentioned that we have an IDPs in, in Puncak Jaya and then IDPs is the part of the result of military operations. <laughs> When you remember the room, the neuro room, the Masaraka Bugan room, the Abogar Postpogarame, Postpogarano, Abogim Lati, Dua Plutuju, Dua Plutuju Abogao, Pogonari, on the Jimino, Ignoramida Pirare, Epen Arini, Ero, and I need to know the new room of Argo, made Dua Plutu Postpogarago, and he followed it. Pogonari, Nin member no, Nina Ulanum. Mendo no marae ponari, Nina Kuya Bam wouldn't win a quay. Ninango, a wow queen, Mudani Mendo, a nequi, on the quotation on the loan, a gino, a bularanga, a gino, Babi and Granaga, Nino Quiriano Vargo. A quino, Nino, the Ninum Lora win a union on the Tangal, Bulan, on the Yarago, Bulan September, Vati, Mudar, Firindum, Mudani Arao, Fevian, the one who can give any hour, Pasukan Fevive, the one that I ignore. The Indonesian government, of course, sees the OPM as a threat to Indonesian territorial integrity, an armed movement that is trying to separate a part of the unitary state and a threat that needs to be counted with military force. However, Indonesian military and government sources acknowledge that as an armed threat, the OPM really is only a minor irritant. It's really the political aspirations that are behind it, which have much more widespread support, that are the, the real threat. <laughs> we haven't actually been able to get to Mulia since the humanitarian crisis there but we have managed to speak to several sources on the ground, some church sources and some other NGOs who've managed to conduct investigations there. And the numbers vary from a few hundred to 15,000. I think the lower estimates are probably more realistic simply because the sources who are giving those numbers are more credible. But it's incredibly difficult to verify, and part of the problem is that impartial observers have difficulty getting into the area. We hired and trained a team of consultants to go into 
the Central Highlands regions and do the, the research. We sent them for three months, essentially, to do a district by district mapping exercise, looking at incidents from the tail end of 2005 and the whole of 2006. And bearing in mind that the conditions, the physical conditions, are incredibly difficult, it's very mountainous, very rugged terrain, they were worth walking on foot for days in between villages to get some of these very remote parts. So they were able to spend three months and basically get a snapshot of what's happening in the Central Highlands region. There's been a transmigration program in Indonesia for decades and one of the aims is to resettle poor landless peasants from overpopulated islands in provinces where there are farming opportunities. But of course another part of the rationale for sending transmigrants to Papua was to alter the demographic balance of the province to make it more plural and more Indonesian rather than being exclusively ethnic Papuan. However, this has always been a strong source of grievance for indigenous Papuans who feel that they're being swamped in their own land. And under the Abdurrahman Wahid government in 2000, the transmigration program to Papua was stopped at the request of Papuan leaders. However, there continue to be large flows of spontaneous economic migrants from other Indonesian islands to Papua. And arguably this will increase with the large scale plantation investment that's being planned in several districts much more effective than the government-sponsored and controlled transmigration project has been the voluntary or economic migration of other Indonesians, mostly from eastern Indonesia, um, from Sulawesi in particular and from the Moluccas. And these are people volunteering, truly, to move to Papua for whatever period of time. And they come with economic skills, capital, uh, networks in place. And they've really taken over pretty much all of the small business opportunities in most of the towns and cities, and even in rural centres. They absolutely dominate the, the local economy in Papua. And that really, if you like, is the friction zone for tension between Papuans and other non-Papuan Indonesians. There are a lot of economic grievances fueling some of the resentment amongst ethnic Papuans towards the Indonesian government and there's a disparity between the distribution of resources that are based in Papua, but Papuans feel they're not seeing the benefit of the oil and gas and minerals that are being mined from those provinces. I think there has been growing international interest in Papua, partly thanks to the energetic lobbying of exiled Papuans and sympathetic solidarity movements linked to the independence movement and several parliamentarians in European and other countries, Australia and New Zealand to, to name a couple of others, have raised the profile of the issue, particularly in the context of a review of the act of free choice, the 1969 vote by a thousand Papuans to join the Republic of Indonesia, which is widely regarded as deeply illegitimate. The Indonesians were required to um put the whole question of incorporation of Netherlands New Guinea into Indo Indonesia to, to a plebiscite, um, a, a representative vote. Now that would have been difficult for anyone to organise, the Dutch uh, or Jakarta, um, and in the end what they did was hand-pick uh, a very small number of, uh, of leading figures from around the province, as they called it, and these people were pretty much coerced into uh, offering 100% support for the incorporation of Netherlands New Guinea uh, into Indonesia. So it was a, a fraudulent show, if you like, of democracy. I can't imagine the Indonesian government allowing another referendum in the foreseeable future, simply because there would be a unanimous vote in favour of independence. I don't imagine the UN General Assembly or Security Council would ever support a review of the act of free choice because it was overseen and sanctioned by the UN at the time.